Clearly, he's a kinesiology major. Um, he's going to be, oh, an interesting fact is that he was named Fast Willie, and for some reason it stuck, and I really, he doesn't play football anymore, so I was confused as to how it stuck. Anyways, uh, now uh, Will's going to talk to you guys about beet root supplementation performance. My name is William Reeves, and today I will be talking about the effects of vegan supplementation on exercise performance. So here's a brief overview of my presentation, how it's going to work. Um, we have the background of beetroot, um, as well as nitrate, and then the mechanisms of which nitrate works within the body. So the focus of this uh, presentation is to look at the nitrate from the beetroot, and we'll also go to the current studies, which have all been done in the last five years. So this is an emerging field. And we have the application of athletics, medicine, and then also future work research in the recently developed field as well. So a brief overview of beet root. We have, it is categorized as one of the functional foods. We have that it is composed of five main bioactive compounds. It is highly dense in uh, nitrate. So what um, scientists have, have shown is that when we have, when we have nitrate in the body, it is converted into nitric oxide, and that increases vasodilation. <coughs> But as we go down the list, we focus more on the topic or the objective of my presentation, which is to explore the physiological effects in which nitrate from beetroot affects muscle metabolism. So we have the five main bioactive compounds of beetroot. Most of them are anti-inflammatory agents and also antioxidants, but the focus of the presentation will be on nitrate itself. So what is nitrate? Nitrate is composed of a nit um, a nitrogen, ion, a nitrogen atom and three oxygen atoms. We have nitrates proposed to be converted into the body into nitric oxide, and it stimulates vasodilation. So nitric oxide is one of the most powerful vasodilators in the body, and the main regulatory functions that it um, maintains are vasodilation, kinetics, and also blood pressure. So, before we go into the studies, we want to understand this concept right here, which is kinetics. So on the uh, timeline down here at zero, this is the onset of exercise. So across this entire graph, this is a, a bout of exercise being performed. So the black line here represents the ATP or the oxygen uptake produced at aerobic metabolism. And the gray line represents the oxygen requirement, um, which is needed for the bout of exercise. So the ATP produced from aerobic metabolism is equivalent to the oxygen uptake. And as you can see, there's a curve because there's initially a delay in aerobic metabolism when we perform about an exercise. So the difference between the black line and the gray dotted line is called the oxygen deficit. So what that is is the area where we now have to produce additional ATP from um, anaerobic metabolism such as um, glycolysis or creatine phosphate. So in this, just to reemphasize this point once again, the black line is aerobic metabolism. The gray line is the oxygen requirement, and the space in between is the oxygen deficit, which is the area where we produce ATP from anaerobic metabolism. So going into our studies, we have, no wait, my bad. So going into the hypothesis, we have that the ingestion of inorganic dietary nitrate leads to the increase of nitric oxide availability. So what that does is it increases vasodilation within the body, we increase blood flow, which means we deliver more oxygen and nutrients to the neighboring tissues. So, the studies here, we have Brees et al. and Bailey et al., 2013 and 2015. Both have similar protocols where they put them on a cycle ergometer, which is this bike, and they put them on a face mask connected to a metabolic heart to measure the VF2 kinetics or the oxygen uptake, which is what we showed you show on the graph earlier. So, they either put the groups into a beet root juice supplementation group or a placebo group, and then train them on the conditions of either moderate or high intensity. So they did what's called a step test. You put them unloaded on a bike for a certain amount of time, and then immediately switch the intensity to either moderate, high, or in this case, low intensity. So what they found is that they tested all subjects in every condition within B group, placebo, low or high intensity. And what they had found after taking blood samples as well is that the resting plasma nitrite levels increased on both studies. And for the v kinetics, after measuring it through the face mask, they found that there was no change at a low intensity or a high intensity, but there was an increase in v kinetics at the 
I mean, at the low, okay, sorry. There was no change at the low intensity and the moderate intensity, but there was a change in the VO2 kinetics at the high intensity. So the question is now, we have this oxygen uptake graph, and when we see an increase in VO2 kinetics, what it looks like now is, is this line right on top. So what the study showed is this graph right here, which mimics what we have up top. The black dots are the red line, and the circular um, empty dots are the green line. So the idea is that when we supplement with beetroot, we increase VO2 kinetics or oxygen uptake. So what they found is that the increase of oxygen up kinetics, oxygen uptake kinetics, decreases the oxygen deficit. And when we decrease the oxygen deficit, we decrease the amount of ATP produced from anaerobic metabolism. And what that means that, is that we produce less metabolites from anaerobic metabolism, which leads to less fatigue. So as you can guess, less fatigue during about an exercise leads to more um, efficient exercise performance. So Griesedal and Bailey et al., the conclusion from the study is that it's not that the ingestion of beetroot juice um, and the nitrate from it will increase anaerobic availability and stimulate vasodilation and increase oxygen uptake kinetics. It's that it does it at a high intensity. So as you remember, it didn't show the increase at the low or moderate, but only the high. And now we have to pose this question as to why that is. So originally in the body, we have this original pathway which functions at rest, low intensity, moderate intensity, or even high intensity. And it's called the L-arginine nitric oxide synthase pathway. So L-arginine, which is found in the bloodstream and as well as the endothelial tissues, reacts with nitric oxide synthase, which is found in the endothelial cells. The two come together and we produce nitric oxide. So after producing nitric oxide, as we have spoken about earlier, it increases vasodilation. So the question is now, <laughs> as you can see, there's no place on this pathway where we see inorganic dietary nitrate or a part of the pathway that explains why at high intensity do we see an uh, increase in VO2 kinetics. So now we have this second proposed pathway which is called the nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide synthesis or nitric oxide pathway and we have the first the ingestion of the root into the body and it interacts with the salivary bacteria. And the salivary, salivary bacteria is located in the dorsal side of the tongue we don't naturally produce it, but we've developed a symbiotic relationship with it. So when the two come together, we reduce nitrate and convert it eventually into nitrite. So here's another study, mouthwash study by Wilson et al. in 2016. It was actually published last Friday on April Fool's Day, but I promise you it is legit. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 12 normal types of subjects, um, and they, meaning that they have normal blood pressure. These, these 12 subjects, they had three types of mouthwash and also the control of water. So the idea was to test three different types of mouthwash with different strengths. So we had chlorhexidine, which is the strongest, we had antibacterial, and antiseptic, and then the control, which was water. So looking at these graphs, they tested the plasma nitrate by taking um, blood samples and then taking saliva samples and testing salivary nitrate. So what they found is that at the strongest, um, uh, the strongest mouth rinses ended up producing the most inhibitory effects of conversion from nitrate to nitrite. Therefore, we see lower levels of plasma nitrate or nitrite and salivary nitrite. So the findings, as we have concluded from the study, is for hexene and antibacterial rinses, which are the two strongest, inhibited the conversion the most. Specifically, they reduced the salivary and the plasma nitrite levels. And this study right here supports at least the first step of this proposed pathway and lets us um, know that nitrate is, and the conversion into nitrite is dependent on the presence of these oral bacteria. So, here's the second part of the pathway. So now that we have nitrite in the bloodstream, um, we have it interact with something called deoxyhemoglobin. So as you can see, we have a red blood cell here. And on the red blood cell, we have deoxyhemoglobin, which is essentially present when there's relative lack of oxygen within the body. So when the two react with one another, we reduce nitrate or nitrite into nitric oxide. So nitric oxide, now as a key biological messenger, interacts with the periphery of the vasculature and interacts again with the smooth muscle. So there's something called guanylate cyclase that nitric oxide interacts with. Guanylate cyclase then upregulates CGMP and then CGMP downregulates calcium within the smooth muscle 
and therefore we stimulate vasodilation. All right, so we have this original pathway we have proposed, which has been around for quite some time. So this is functional at low, moderate, high intensity, and even rest. But we also have the second pathway where we explain that the nitrate, the inorganic dietary nitrate from beetroot, interacts with our oral bacteria to produce nitrite. The nitrite is then reduced by deoxyhemoglobin, and deoxyhemoglobin, okay, so yeah, nitro oxide is produced from deoxyhemoglobin and nitrite, and then nitric oxide is then causing more vasodilation. So we finally addressed this issue of which pathway and how, how do we come from inorganic dietary nitrite to producing more nitric oxide, we still have not addressed why at high intensity exercise do we see an increase in DO2 kinetics, or in this case, vasodilation. So the high intensity exercise, what it does is that when you exercise at high intensity, there is less relative oxygen within the body because our, our body demands more. So that induces what's called a hypoxic condition which means there's less relative oxygen, which means there's going to be more deoxyhemoglobin present with the blood. <coughs> so hypoxic condition, in this case high intensity exercise, leads to the presence of more deoxyhemoglobin, which is deoxygenated hemoglobin from the red blood cells. We have more interaction between the nitrite and the deoxyhemoglobin, producing more nitric oxide and stimulating more vasodilation within the body. So going into the conclusion of our study, so we have talked about inorganic dietary nitrite and how it only functions in hypoxic conditions. Secondly, it functions within a separate pathway that is not seen um, already present within the body at all states. And the thing is that this separate pathway does not inhibit or cause any sort of negative feedback on the other pathway. It simply produces additional nitric oxide. And we have this here, the results that suggest um, beetroot and a similar precursor can, use it, can be used as a dietary um, nitric oxide donator or a treatment for people who are deficient <coughs> in nitric oxide. The last thing here is that beetroot supplementation, as you saw from earlier, can increase exercise um, at a high intensity. So we increase beetroot to kinetics, decrease the oxygen deficit, and furthermore, decrease fatigue, improve performance. So we've already kind of talked about the application to athletics, but have not yet talked about the application to a clinical setting. So as you know, inorganic dietary nitrate helps us produce or provide additional nitric oxide. So people who are deficient in nitric oxide could possibly see a benefit to, to using this as a, uh, as a treatment. So NO deficiency can occur within the following diseases, which are diabetes, we have pulmonary disease and also cardiovascular diseases. And what's common among these three things is that there's usually the symptoms of being hypertensive. So the um, deficiency of nitric oxide typically causes the hypertension within these three different um, related diseases. And if we are able to provide more nitric oxide, we're able to um, potentially increase the NO production and enhance healthy vascular function within these three disease statuses. So future research, um, as I said, all of the research that has been done on this topic has only been done in the last like five years. And the thing is that most of these studies have looked at males 20 from 25. The, they have also done sample sizes of like seven to only like 12 uh, subjects. And also looking at different types of subjects. Right now we only have this, this small sliver of a population which is the um, 20 to 25 year old males where we still can test for either elite athletes, we can also test for uh, patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease, people who are deficient in nitric oxide. So for future research, we definitely need to widen our spectrum and figure out the, I guess, overall effects of inorganic dietary nitrate. And another thing is looking at different types of subjects, along with testing across different health statuses, we can also look into um, different uh, either def different sexes. So against men or women, women have been uh, suggested that they produce more plasma nitrites. So there could be uh, another study looking into that, as well as the anti-inflammatory responses that are um, present within the inorganic inter dietary nitrites. There's uh, a study that has suggested that it, it inhibits one of the inflammatory pathway um, signaling molecules. So we have that, which could also apply to medicine in this case. 
um, muscle biopsies as well. So muscle biopsies should be taken before and after an acute bout of exercise in order for us to understand the metabolic properties of the muscle in some more detail. And the way uh, most studies typically do it, because it's, it's uh, applied physiology vibes, they don't go into the cellular level or even molecular level to look at what happens at the mitochondria and other things like that. So definitely I think that it would be, it's, it's not too difficult to do. It is expensive to um, do muscle biopsies, but that is, I think, a really big step for the next studies that are coming out. So thank you, the kinesiology department. Uh, specifically, thank you, Mel, for guiding us through the comps class, and Roberts for being my advisor. Thank you for my families and friends, for uh, my family and friends for coming out here. And uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Trend? 
So the trend, so the fact that the uh, the curve is is higher or steeper than the placebo group. So the B group is higher than the placebo. Group. Yeah. Yeah. So is there like a threshold of how much uh, nitrogen oxide? Like, is there a certain point where it like doesn't? It's not beneficial anymore? Yeah. So I actually have another. <laughs> so here was another study that looked at how much meat reduces enough. So typically what they do is that there's a company called Beat It. It's kind of funny, but um, <laughs> in, when 70 milliliters of um, meat juice it usually has the 8.4 millimole. So what they found is that once you got to um, 140 milliliters of the beetroot juice, there was kind of like the saturation effect where once you take more than 140 milliliters, it wasn't really any more effect. I mean, it does show this graph a little bit lower, but typically they're both the same um, difference from the baseline or the 70 milliliters. So, yeah. Cool. So, so what, yeah. Is, what? So I like beets, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, so tell us like beets versus beetroot versus beet juice. Versus the leaves. I mean, what's the? How are these made? Yeah, I, I looked at. Yeah, I looked at just the juice. Um, actually, I I would assume that it would be the same. Similar effects, but the thing is, the juice is that it's mostly extracted from the beet root, so it's more dense in nitrite or nitrates. There are other vegetables that also have high levels of nitrate, but beet root has been the one that has been converted to juice and shown even like. Higher, like even a higher level of nitrate in the final product. So, 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 so beets, oh, though, right? Beets. What's that? So the beet root is the beet. Right? Well, it's, it's actually the beet root. Or as far as the little tail on the bottom. I don't remember. Do you know what a beet looks like? Yes. Oh, the name's on the grass. Square roots and beets. It's the beet. It's the beet. It's the root. That's the beet. Yeah. I got that part. Oh. So they actually sell at the marketplace now. Eight dollars. It's delicious. Mostly with cherry juice and apple juice. Is it really good? Have you done it before exercising? Um, actually, I have not. I have not tried that yet. I should have did a cell test as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, do professional athletes drink beet juice? Like yeah, so there was one of the studies I looked at before was kind of giving like a review of like the background. And the research behind it had just started around like five, five, ten years ago. And when it, right when it started, there was a story about basically Olympic athletes, that are endurance athletes, Taking him as beat root. But as far as performance, they haven't quantified or figured out, oh, well, he's you know gotten 10 seconds faster because he drank this drink before <laughs> his, uh, his race two hours before. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not too sure. But yeah, it, it is a thing in the athletic world. Recent things. Cool.